Buenos días, muchísimas gracias por su asistencia. Les damos la más cordial bienvenida a parte de Hexport y del Foro de Innovación. Eh, vamos a, a tener el gusto eh, de compartir una hora eh, con Chase. Eh, él es CEO de SG Brands, ¿verdad? Nos va a apoyar con la conferencia en Creating the Future Sustainability. Eh, bienvenidos. Voy a compartirles un poco más sobre, sobre Chase. Chase es el CEO de SG Brands, enfocado en maximizar la cadena de suministro de fibra natural a través de la ciencia de los materiales. Tiene más de 12 años de experiencia en innovación de productos y cadenas de valor, incrementando el rendimiento y las tecnologías impulsadas por la sostenibilidad para Nike. Eh, Columbia Sportwear y clientes in institucionales en el área de la ciencia de materiales y vehículos eléctricos. Tiene una licenciatura en diseño de producto de la Universidad de Oregon con certificados de la Escuela de Negocios en Línea de Harvard y la Facultad de Textiles de Carolina del Norte. Eh, muchísimas gracias por su asistencia. Eh, tenemos la opción de, de, de traducción en la parte de Zoom donde dice eh, Interpretation. Ahí pueden eh, también colocar la opción para, para eh, seleccionar el idioma, cambiar el idioma, ¿verdad? ya que eh, Chase va a estar con, eh, impartiendo la conferencia en, en inglés. Eh, de acuerdo a, eh, eh, vamos con relación a las preguntas, ¿verdad? Y respuestas, eh, pueden ir haciéndole la consulta a Chase durante la conferencia para que puedan eh, ir aclarando dudas. Muchas gracias. Buenos días. And I will, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint. Give me one moment. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes, Chase, we're able. Yep. Perfecto, gracias. Uh, buenos días. Uh, Memo es Chase Common. And my, my entire career has been in the apparel and footwear industry. And it has entirely been focused on innovation. Um, and when I was asked to present today, um, you know, I was asked to focus on what I've been doing my entire career, the last 12 years. See? Yeah. My, my apologies. Sorry, someone else had a video who might have picked up the audio. Uh, when I was asked to present, uh, how does sustainability represent an opportunity to innovate? That is, uh, that is something that has guided the last five plus years of my career within product development, business creation. Um, and what it's, what it's created for me is this amazing in, in simplified North Star for how do you think about creating something new for sport or creating something new for getting people outdoors. You know, my perspective has lived on a spectrum of the value chain from all the way from raw material extraction, right? And, and before that, the creation of new ideas, all the way through product development, through go-to-market marketing, and then how it how it actually sits in a retail environment and, and um, is represented to the consumer. So my last 12 years have been working for brands, uh, for brands like Columbia Sportswear and Nike. And now I most recently have started my own manufacturing company, converting agricultural waste into the raw materials for the textile industry at large. So the topic of my discussion today is, as you can see, creating the future right, through sustainability as a North Star. And I think it's most appropriate to actually go back to the very beginning, where I started, right? And sustainability can mean different things to different people, and it can mean different things to different businesses, right? Depends where you sit in the supply chain and how you engage with your customers or your consumers. It's an opportunity to optimize products, and operations and compete for a global business most 
relevant today than, than ever before due to global policy, consumer demands, and also as important to serve the consumer and add newness to business. And I think there's there's an important factor if we if we land on or focus on newness to business, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit in a little bit later. But at the beginning of my career, you know, my perspective on how to innovate grew over time. So I used to work on a performance innovation team where. I would conceptualize with my team uh, new ideas for constructing uh, products or how to make new materials to keep people warm in places like Svalbard here, the northernmost uh, country in the world or northernmost inhabited landmass in the world. It was absolutely beautiful. Been to Alaska to go and test these performance products um, in wet and cold environments, Iceland, to do the same, North Cascades. Uh, I did a lot of things that were keeping you warm. So most of my trips were where, where I would probably be very cold. But one of the perspectives that I was able to gain by being able to have a job where I could go and create products and then go test them in the world over the course of six years, this is when I, when I worked at Columbia Sportswear, was I would go back some of the same places, and this is me getting in a shot, um, but I would go back to these same places and they started to change, right? They started to, to slowly look different for me, you know, and I would, I would see very real impacts um, from just consumers at large, but it got me to really think and gain perspective not only traveling all over the world, right, to be in the, in the living, the real environment where my products were being tested, but I was able to experience the entire value chain, right? So the value chain being at the very beginning, whether you're an apparel or footwear company, if you're a product company, right? The beginning is where you design um, and, and develop and think of the new things that you want to create um, from the raw materials that you want to take from, how you're going to spin that or make the material um, how you're going to finish that material before you cut it, sew it, mold it, combine it into some product. And then, of course, how it gets shipped around the world, sits in retail spaces, is used, you know, in the environment. And then eventually at the very end, you know, is it, um, uh, is it sent to landfill or is it, is it returned, right? Is it recycled? Is it, is it uh, put into a circular uh, method? A circular circular design process. Now, so I had this perspective, right? I had perspective of being able to to do the to to have my hands in the entire value chain, to be able to conceptualize products and bring them to life, but then also to live and work in the factories, right, and see the impact there. And this perspective gave me opportunity to think about things differently. I was still very focused on performance-driven technologies, right? The hydrophobicity and the chemicals that you can add to textiles, but how do we think about this differently? And this started to create new products during my time at this outdoor brand. But then how do we rethink, you know, what are there, what alternatives are there to cotton, right? Is, is this the best material for us to be using? Is it the best material for us to, to be using at such a massive scale? And then as we dug in to understand, okay, what's the actual impact on the land that we're using? What's the actual impact of the process? Are there alternatives out there that maybe impact the land differently, that maybe require different processes? Or even better, one of the things that I have thought about quite often through my, throughout the, the last six years of my innovation career has been we have a material palette that has been decently standard for at least in our, in our uh, the last hundred plus years, we've been pulling from a material palette, right? From fossil fuels and, and um, the current natural fibers, and as an innovator, 
That's the palette that we've been pulling through today. But what if we were to open our eyes and start to look at what, what are the other natural materials that are out there? How can we leverage biomimicry, right? Or how can we pull from the natural world and, and, and learn from how nature is doing things best? How can we use what already exists? So this idea of, of recycling or circularity. And then how do we create products that when they're leveraging or using their raw materials, and then perhaps at the end of this product's life, how does it actually regenerate the system, right? And, and in sustainability, you know, there's, there's things like greenwashing or these buzzwords like sustainability has become a buzzword. Um, regenerative is a new word that if you haven't heard about this word often or haven't heard this word um, too frequently yet, regenerative is the new thing within the industry. And it's, it's a buzzword because it's gaining popularity, rightfully so, like they need to, right? Things need to be recycled. Products need to be looked at from a circularity perspective. We have to start looking at things from a regenerative perspective because what we have realized over time and the consumers are realizing it more than anyone else is that the raw materials that we take in manufacturing have very real consequences to the the world around us and so there's these there are alternative means that we can explore to create existing products so there's some uh, such things as biosynthetics right uh, it creates a synthetic material so a, a plastic like or a plastic material but it is coming from nature that's regenerative right it will reproduce itself or you can reproduce it in a lab and there is a, a push and pull, right, in our industry today. And this pushing and pulling mechanism is what uh, impacts our businesses, you know, and the decisions that we have to make. You know, I, I think of the term business is business, right? We got into business to serve some value to our, to our customers. And we got into this business to either be competitive, to pull uh, from feedstocks and create value for brands or consumers. Um, and perhaps we got into business to create something innovative and bring that to market in a novel way. And there's now this pushing and pulling mechanism within sustainability, right? That's the brands and the consumers due to public policy and um, understanding the opportunities of sustainability that our, our consumers are pulling the brands to say, we want newness, right? We, we need you guys to be the expert and bring something exciting to life and reduce your impact. And these brands, what are brands good at? Especially in the apparel and footwear world, right? Brands are really good storytellers. The good ones are great. And, but brands are not manufacturers. Brands don't actually take the raw material and convert it into some value-added product that brands can then cut and sew together, mold, form, drive off a factory line. And so manufacturers are being pulled in this direction from consumers and brands and, and, and for manufacturers to win, right? And this is what I've spent a lot of my consulting um, over the last few years doing is how do manufacturers win and gain new business um, to sell to their to, to the brands, right? The ones I speak with. And these manufacturers, they need to bring newness and they need, the, the brands are relying on them to lead them to the market, essentially. And they have, there's so much opportunity within manufacturing because with so much data and so much knowledge out there, you can understand what the consumers want, right? What the end consumer, the people on the ground, what they want. And so you're able to understand, okay, you know, if, if we make polyester, we make synthetic based materials and we understand that, well, polyester t-shirts have been around for a really long time and it's always come from the same material. And well, that's been a very stable business, but with sustainability as a North star, and I'll go into this a little bit more later, 
with sustainability as a North Star, you're now able to look at how your current material mix might be able to be conceptualized in a different way. And fortunately, there's a lot of companies who are doing that. And that's this next gen material space. And the numbers speak for themselves, right? There is massive investment in the next gen material space because there are all of these new businesses who are trying to create the, the future of what we do, right? This next gen material space. This is, this is data from 2021 and it's been exponentially growing. I got into the space, right? I own a next gen uh, manufacturing company, right? It's a startup and we're growing. But there's so much money being poured into this space because they know that, that your end consumer, the end consumer of, of, our, of, of any industry, is looking for innovation to develop new materials. And as an innovator myself, the most exciting thing that I spoke about earlier was, you know, as I'm thinking of creating new technology, whether it's keeping somebody, somebody dry in a rainstorm, or it is keeping someone warmer with less material on them or using less material to, to, to perform some benefit. My, the palette that I've used near the beginning of my career was the same palette that everyone else could use, right? Fossil fuel based or natural fibers based. But when I opened my optics to understand that we were in a box of material science, but when we open up our optics and start to look at alternative manufacturing means, you know, these next gen materials, this is what these companies are doing. How do we leverage? And you've, you've heard of some of them, um, uh, you know, mycelium leathers. Um, you know, how do we break down materials that exist today to create new novel material science? Um, how are we taking things that already exist? Um, and currently get destroyed on, on farms? How do we take those and start to investigate and, and, and say, okay, how, there's something new here. You know, one great example is, is sugarcane, right? Taking the sugars and the byproducts of sugarcane industry and being able to convert those into bioethanol, which can make bioethylene. And bioethylene is EVA, right? It's a foam underneath your feet. Now, there's other sugars out there that can do the same thing, right? And, and there's different um, hurdles that have to be crossed to be able to, or overcome, to be able to achieve certain scientific processes. Um, but it's an exciting space and it's growing. And, and the reasons that NextGen is, is a thing, right? It's because of all of these issues on the left. And from a brand and a consumer perspective, it's most important on the very bottom, right? There are 2025 and 2030 climate targets that specifically in apparel and footwear, um, they have made aggressive climate targets focused on reducing their impact. And we'll talk about what, what impact looks like in a little bit, but um, due to policy, brands in, in certain parts of the world, they have to reduce their carbon impact, which is um, very measurable, right? Through uh, carbon accounting, right? A brand knows what, based off of all of their business practices within their owned and operated supply chain, and even outside of what they own and operate, what their carbon impact is. And they're saying, they're, they're saying, we need, we, we are committing to reduce our impact by, we'll say 30%. Every brand's different. And we, we will reduce our impact by 30% by 2025. Most brands don't have a solution. They actually won't meet those climate targets without manufacturers and next-gen materials bringing things to market, right? So there's this push and pull mechanism that I talked about earlier. And these brands are going to fail at their climate targets unless they have solutions and they need to rely on manufacturers and next gen material space, the next gen material space in order to meet these climate targets. And these drivers on the right, as you can see, and you probably already read, is a very massive um, 
growing industry in the material space. And, and, and we'll go into where the impact exists, right? So when brands are focused on reducing their sustainability, where does the impact exist in a product, right? So what, what are, where are the levers that you can, you can pull to reduce that carbon impact? And during my time, uh, I used to work at Nike on sustainable innovation. Um, before I got there, I developed this perspective, right? This perspective on how do I evaluate new technology? How do I evaluate these next gen materials coming into the brand, you know, or these new materials coming in from manufacturers to the brand, right? There's, there's three very important um, measuring sticks. And, and we hear, we hear enough about the issues of our business practices and why sustainability is past being a buzzword. So much so, right, as I talked about that the laws of some countries are putting pressure on greenwashing, rightfully so. And my education and as a result, um, the message that I wanna relay is not about unrealistic fast transitions from current feedstocks or cutting into the bottom lines of your business. It's to show you how business actually has an opportunity to thrive because of sustainability. It's the main reason why I chose to start my manufacturing company today, because there's a very real tangible opportunity through sustainable innovation, through the perspective of sustainability, performance, and economics to actually prop up margins, right? Bring more, uh, uh, more opportunity to business. And so I'll, I will leave uh, this triangle here, but I want everybody to know that from a brand's perspective, this is how things are measured. It has to be lower impact if we're gonna bring it in. The performance has to at least be baseline, if not better, but it has to at least be the same as what it's replacing. And then I use economics instead of just cost because brands understand that as newness is coming in, smaller or, or um, paying slightly more is acceptable as long as the long-term economics is reducing the cost over time. So there has to be a cost competitiveness to whatever new materials are being brought in. And there are already so many Ferrari-like materials that cost so much more. And those have their place in the market, but order to have uh, equal access to sustainability at an industrial scale, uh, a hat trick has to be played to be able to scale um, commercially viable, low impact alternatives. And that for some part of the equation, it actually leans on manufacturers to be able to open open floor space, right? Um, uh, open, open, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but give access to be able to scale these new materials within manufacturing. So they, so they have the ability to scale and feed the market and reduce their, 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 um, their overhead, their cost of goods sold over time. Now I, I've created a theory in, during my career and this, this theory came, came to me six plus years ago. And it was this, this idea that I realized, and this was at a time when Apple computers had already had a runway of 10 years of just massive product success. And other brands that had huge success within innovation. What I realized was, there, there's this traction that can be withhold for 10 years, right? There's, uh, you can have such tremendous value and brand present representation in a market for about 10 years before, before you start 
to have the competitors really chipping away at at um, uh, your your footing in the marketplace. And so, even in the best of situations, what I realized was, and I'll use the Apple example. They were market leaders for ten years, right? Or you could look at GoPro cameras. They were market leaders for a long time. And then what happened was for Apple, all other phones started being just as good. Um, other computers and chip processors were just as good. And what, what happened was there was about, there were 10 years that they owned the market. And then they needed to have the wake up call, right? or they needed to understand that they no longer could just ride the wave of being um, the, the leaders in the industry. They had to reinvent themselves, right? No business survives the long-term without reinventing itself. And this is where you know my perspective, um, as I was an innovator for a very long time, focused on performance, I started to change and, and realize that you know, sustainability is something that I wanted to focus on. And what sustainability did is it was an is an opportunity for me to bring newness into the products that I <clears throat> that I was creating and developing. And what this newness does, right, is it brings stability uh, to the business and growth. Right, it allows when you're focusing on innovation and creating uh, new products, um, as I spoke about earlier, it allows you a new perspective on on how to create something new to replace an existing product right biosynthetic if it's something like that um, rather than using oil how do we use um, the sugars from sugarcane and there's five things that need to be looked at right when you're when you're um, evaluating your business year in and year out despite having very profitable bottom lines there's fault lines. And, and one thing that was interesting when I came up um, with this um, brand leaders or innovation leaders can only hold the market for 10 years before someone's going to come in and has really figured out how to kind of take them off the pedestal. What I realized over time was, you know, I realized something in the market just by seeing it, but there's actual um, research and data behind this, that 10 years is actually a, a pretty common uh, metric for when brands or, or companies start to lose, uh, lose traction if they don't reinvent themselves. And there's fault lines that can be recognized, right? What are your customer needs? Um, what are the performance metrics on how you're actually measuring the business? How you measured your business on year one uh, might be dramatically different in year two because maybe the market's shifted a bit. You know, what is your industry position? Maybe from a raw material or, or a polyester business, maybe your business was 100% focused on scaling polyester yarn, right? You pushed polyester yarn into the market. A small shift would be, hey, we need to get into recycled polyester. We're going to use bottles, right? Well, Everyone over the last 20 years has started to do that. But how do we maybe blend polyester with a man-made cellulosic fiber, right? Is there a new industry position that we can grow and develop? Are we a product leader, a market leader? You know, are we a conglomerate? Are we absorbing many businesses and growing that way? But understanding what are the fault lines? Like, is your industry changing? And are you changing with it? Are you pushing newness into your customer's hands so that they can feed their market. And what is your business model? A great example here uh, would be Netflix, right? Netflix um, for the longest time was a business model focused on um, uh, DVDs, right? You would pick up DVDs or they'd mail DVDs to you. Well, for a while that worked and then they understanding that their market was changing and they completely shifted their business model and said, we're going to go just on demand, right? And we know the story of Netflix today. So being able to understand, despite being a market leader, 
in 10 years, you may lose that and you have to recognize the fault lines and sustainability provides an opportunity uh, to be able to um, play to reducing impact, uh, having alternative performance opportunities, and perhaps from an economics perspective, um, uh, um, improving efficiencies and reducing costs. And so sustainability is North Stars, right? Um, it's just that, just what I, what I, what I spoke about earlier. It, it gives clarity to purpose. One of the things that I, that I experienced quite often um, when I was focused on performance innovation, my metric was the wickability of a, of a material, right? Or what's the breathability of a material? And the, pro the products are so good that it's difficult to make any perceivable or recognizable adjustment in performance. And, and we need to fund and we need to fuel performance innovation, absolutely. But when you are within a business setting, right? As an innovator, as a developer of, of new products and new ideas, it was hard to sell uh, uh, a team on, oh, the performance on the wicking capabilities of this material is 10% better. Like, well, I can't feel it, but it's 10% better. Well, I can't sell that. It's 10% better. That was the story, right? So um, those provided its challenges. But then as I moved into you know, a new focus on sustainability innovation, it was now this, this beautiful North Star that said, hey, we this t-shirt is this amount of carbon emissions well i can replace it with this material and i just cut the carbon emissions by half and you know this brand they need to reduce their impact by half you know i'm also actually using less material um, and i'm using an alternative material and I'm using less of it because it has different performance properties and it feels just as good. And so what sustainability as a North Star did to me in my career was no matter what, you know, up and down a corporate ladder, sustainability as a North Star and as a, as a, as a measurement of uh, accomplishment or failure and, and, and bringing something new to life, it was easy to understand. And it also opened up this treasure trove of, of alternative material science opportunities, right? We're no longer super focused on this specific area of polyester, but we could focus on, oh, there's, there's these, there are these other materials out there that allow us to achieve the exact same thing and their byproducts will allow us to achieve these new things. And so it was exciting, you know, it, it opened up the, the toolbox for me to create. And just to bring us back a little bit, you know, to cover what is sustainability from the perspective of the brands, right? Uh, well, perspective at large, sustainability has to do with, with climate change, right? It has to do with uh, adding to landfill or microplastics in the ocean, water scarcity, hazardous chemicals, right? Are there green chemistries or, or uh, hazardous chemicals being used or, or leaving factories and going into waterways or in contact with human skin? There's biodiversity with a focus on eutrophication and there's human health and human rights. And then in does, does sustainability, how does it impact a bottom line? do brands look at it from a triple bottom line perspective? And these show up in five ways, right? And so these are five ways focused on product sustainability. So you'll see, I got rid of the social aspect and then the triple bottom line with the economics. And so carbon emissions, right? That's climate change. There's waste, there's microplastics there. There's industrial waste, as we are all very familiar with. 
And then there's post-consumer waste with water, right? Water scarcity, um, um, drinking water scarcity from a chemistry perspective, um, hazards to human health and our planet. And then with eutrophication, there's biodiversity with eutrophication. Um, that's a, a major component of how our um, chemicals um, entering the waterways um, and affecting the ecosystem at large, right? Through either algae blooms, and with, which sucks up oxygen from the water, which is hazardous and harmful um, for obvious reasons. And so these are, these are ways, right, that brands um, uh, are looking at sustainability at large. And there's a hyper focus on climate change, right? So carbon emissions and a hyper focus on reducing waste and then uh, also chemistry. Different brands have different perspectives as well. And I think this is a very real slide to show where the impact exists within product or within the supply chain, the value chain at large. And so from a climate change perspective, from a carbon emissions, a vast majority of the impact, over 50%, exists in, uh, in the raw materials and the processes and the chemicals added to make a product. So from the pushing and pulling mechanism, when brands have climate targets for 2025 and 2030, where do you think they're going to look to try to reduce their carbon impact? And I'm sure you've already, for the last five years, you've probably seen this, but they're looking to the manufacturers, right, to be able to reduce their impact. And then at a later effect, right, consumer use, so the, the washing and the drying of the apparel, you know, product, a vast majority of it goes there. So these are ways, uh, you know, when I was developing product and focused on sustainable innovation for brands, I would look at this, right? And I would, I would ask myself, okay, well, raw material, what am I using, right? Is it cotton? How do I reduce that? How do I reduce the water intake of, of what cotton impacts and the carbon impact? And so this is how we would measure we're going to reduce our impact. And it's a pretty good rough idea of, okay, if I make these changes in these areas, um, the impact will be reduced. And then we could measure this, right, through um, third-party validated impact assessments. We don't need to go into life cycle analysis at the very beginning from an innovation perspective. Impact assessments do a great job of, of helping direct where the needle's going to go. And so let's remember, right, the push-pull, right? So what does sustainability mean for your business? How are you feeding, you know, the apparel and footwear system? How are you feeding it? Are you yourself evaluating these next-gen materials? Are you creating them yourself? And then how are you selling those and allowing brands to actually pull them in? And I won't stay on this slide for too long. However, here's many opportunities, right, for reducing impact. As I say here, product sustainability equals product development. What are the decisions that are being made that will reduce the impact? right, from dye types and processes. Um, from a manufacturing point of view, are you allowing larger bulk orders for dope dye techniques? Um, are you exploring mechanical shredding to produce recycled polyester, right? Um, so post-consumer or post-industrial recycled polyester, cotton, things like that. And then one of the more interesting things that, that has a very real impact on um, the sustainability of brands and manufacturers is if you look where the calendar is, the order calendar, right? When are brands ordering their product or what are the lead times required for a brand to place an order and make sure that it gets fulfilled? Because brand calendars, they're, they're all over the place, right? Everyone's different. But that is one of the easier, well, not easier. That is, that is one of the lower hanging fruit opportunities for adjusting how calendars align and what the order timelines have to be to get product made 
in order to reduce the unnecessary waste, right, that gets created. And then also quality assurance. Uh, quality is very, very important. Consistency is key, right? With apparel and footwear, you know, as I know best. Um, and what's interesting is we're humans um, of habit and, and quality is important, but can we reevaluate quality, right? If there's one nip, in a, in a bulk order of textile, do you have to get rid of the whole textile, right? The whole roll of, of fiber, of fabric. In many cases that happens. Um, how do brands evaluate that and say it's, you know, it's part of the, the process. This is, you know, how do they tell that story? And so all of these impacts, right? Uh, carbon, waste, water, biodiversity or eutrophication, um, and I think I said chemistry, those, those five components make up product sustainability. And from an innovation perspective and from a manufacturing perspective, these are all areas that you can leverage, right? To rethink about how, what are the raw materials that you're pulling in or what are the products that you're creating and how can, how can alternative materials or alternative methods of thinking reduce the overall impact? of the product that you create. So I'm wildly excited about sustainability innovation. I think it gives a very clear perspective um, and opportunity to create something new and bring something new to life. We only have a hundred years on this planet and it's my, my goal in life to be able to make the most of that, share the most ideas so that we can have these alternative materials scale, right? And these alternative methods of, of circular product of those scale and flourish and regenerate the life um, and the planet that we live on. Um, here's three three of the businesses that I I work through. Um, I consult often, um, consult by myself with ISRD with a, a team of industry experts. Um, many of them ex Nike with Zephyr, and then my own manufacturing. Um, uh, next gen real startup with ESG brands. Um, I, I welcome any questions, clarity. Um, moving forward, I'll open the floor. Evelyn, I am all done with my, my presentation. Thank you. So if there are any questions or any, yeah, any questions about sustainability in, in the industry, um, perspectives of brands, uh, please let me know. And I apologize, my Spanish is not uh, where it needs to be conversationally, um, but I do travel to uh, specifically Central America often enough and I'm trying to improve it. Thank you so much, Chase, for your presentation. Um, queridos directores, a las personas que nos acompañan, si pueden también abrir su micrófono y hacer las preguntas directamente a Chase, le gusta mucho eh, ser interactivo con las personas. Pueden abrir sus micrófonos, suscribirlas en el chat y las vamos a estar leyendo. Gracias. Si, si quieren abrir sus micrófonos, también pueden hacerlo. Para mientras, eh, voy a leer una pregunta, Chase. Tenemos ¿Puede compartir alguna experiencia en mejora de sostenibilidad en cuanto a alimentos? ¿O bien en bolsas flexibles?
Chase, do you have the, um, can you hear the question? Oh, I could not, no. Uh, okay, maybe if the um, Felipe wants to help me, please. Yes, just uh, Chase has to change the the way that he listen. Um, I can hear. I can hear you, Cynthia. Hmm. I can see um, some messages in the chat, but I I can hear. You, Melissa, and Cynthia, I could hear you. Yes, do you have the option to change the language that you hear? And in interpretation, you can change to English okay. to hear the translator. Um, I cannot, I can see, I do see one question that, um, I understand. I can read it. You want me to answer that one? Can you tell us um, what would what would I consider the three more important things to consider about sustainability in the industry? Yeah, I'll answer yes. that one. Please and go, then, with, go with that. And, mm -hmm. and then I'll try to figure out the um, audio in a bit. Uh, okay. Geez. So the three the three most important things to consider about sustainability. So I think it's important to understand my perspective. Right. There's it, the way I look at sustainability and business on a spectrum. And so on one far side, you have those who are wildly passionate about sustainability and they're very important, right? But it's almost at the detriment to business. And then you have your other far side, your focus on business, right? Bottom line by all means. And, and there's obviously inherent issues with that for the planet, right? Great profits. But issues there. And so I sit, I sit somewhere in the middle. I truly do. And I, I probably lean closer to the business side because I leverage sustainability as this beautiful opportunity to do a lot of good, right? But be able to prop up um, the opportunities of, of business. And so that's how I look at sustainability, right? Now, the, I think the three most important things to sustainability is we have to be able to scale uh, low cost sustainable products because a brand could maybe sell a hundred thousand units of a material that that cost twenty cents or twenty percent more than its than its replacement, but it's not going to go and sell a million, five million, ten million units the next year unless the economics make sense, unless the economics are going down. So there has to be scalable commodity grade impacts or sustainable um, materials that come to life. So at, at, in, that, in that plays to a few areas of opportunity, I think for manufacturing, but then also for these next generation materials. And one issue with, manufacturing from a, a, a next-gen material perspective is the capacity in factories is often not available for these next-generation materials. There are factories, very few of them, but there are factories opening up who are completely focused on next-gen materials. And so the capacity is there to scale that because in order to be able to have um, accessible sustainability, the margins of scale have to come into play. Manufacturers have to be able to open up uh, capacity so they can run the volume potentially required by brands. So I think accessible sustainability is really important in how we look at our, our um, manufacturing lines and truly market to the industry and say, we have 10% of our, of our line, 5% of our line dedicated to next generation material. I think you will have a, a large number of people knocking at your door saying, awesome, you have capacity, let's try this. 
that's the second thing. And from an innovation and from a perspective of an innovator, being willing to try things is really important because that allows these alternative sustainable innovations to learn and improve, right? They need that. They need those partners. They need those, those innovation factory partners. And then from a, a, a true sustainability sense, I think we, we really need to evaluate, okay, for, for, for each person's business, how can you think about sustainability from a, a process and an operation perspective as well? And so how do you look at saving time, reducing the number of steps, or investing in new technologies to reduce the amount of waste produced, right? Because waste adds up and waste is carbon impact and waste is eutrophication. Waste, waste plays to many different areas on the sustainability um, measuring metrics. So being able to take care of waste and invest in technologies to kind of repurpose that is vastly important. And then uh, circularity, which is a word I'm sure many people have heard of, but being able to look at your business and understand, okay, how, how do I create a circular business model or partner smart so we can, um, through this collaborative method, how can we create a circular business model so I can secure my feedstock for my products for the long run? Right, so I don't, I don't have ten years of wild success in the market, and missed all the opportunities to realize that perhaps the bottles that are feeding my recycled polyester are actually being owned by the Coca Colas and the, the Danons of the world because they need to make, they need to take their bottles and put them back into bottles. So it's a cautionary tale, right? Um, bottles aren't going to cost the same amount. Um, in five years as they did five years ago. So, so always be exploring um, how to collaborate, uh, focusing on circularity, focusing on um, uh, reducing waste. Um, uh, and then from a factory perspective, making sure that you're giving way for these next-gen materials to actually have a chance, right? To, to give them um, uh, opportunities um, and capacity. We also have a comment, it says, uh, Roberto, thank you very much. Very refreshing with um, new terms for me. So I thank you for that. your presentation. Yeah. And then I see, so it's, I can't, um, I can hear you, but if other people are asking questions, um, I don't know if I can hear them, but there are some questions in here. If you want me to answer these last two. Um, so one is any experience yes, in-, in if, you're, yeah. if you are able, please go ahead, uh, Chase. Yeah, so any experience in improving food sustainability, more specifically on packaging of food. So I do have a little bit of food experience just for my agricultural space, uh, the, the agricultural space I'm in right now with manufacturing, but not specific to actually producing food or packaging food. But um, uh, packaging was a very big deal uh, at the brands that I worked with as well, right? The, the Nikes and the Columbia Sportswear of the world. And the industry at large often thinks that um, packaging will shift the, or reduce the impact of a brand the most, right? Because it's, it's a thing that consumers see firsthand, right? You see the package as it arrives. It's such a small amount of impact in the grand scheme of a product. However, every product's different, right? So if you're selling fruit, right? The fruit is something that's being grown um, uh, or you're selling food, right? It's being produced and, and packaged into a container. Now, the big, the big buzz or the things that are rising to the top within packaging are um, one of the first ones that I saw uh, maybe five, 10 years ago 
was uh, leveraging mushrooms, right? Or mycelium to essentially grow the packaging around, we'll say for fruit or for the, the inset tray that things will sit on top of. And the reason that that's really important and interesting is we know that we get so much packaging today. So how are we evaluating the packaging options that we have? So it's something that doesn't pile up or, or keep adding to um, landfill, right? Does it truly biodegrade? And that's a very touchy subject, biodegradability. Um, does, does a product or a packaging material actually biodegrade without leaching um, the chemistries that maybe made that product? Um, because when biodegrade, biodegradation within packaging is probably one of the bigger opportunities because packaging contributes so much to landfill. So that's kind of one of the big areas that you can, you can uh, um, affect. And so when you look at biodegradation, this is where greenwashing comes into play is biodegradation how? There's industrial processed biodegradation, right? It actually has to be like industrially, industrially biodegraded, or is it actually composting in someone's backyard, right? Um, and I don't, I don't have the best answers for the packaging space, um, just based off my experience. But a few areas to really be looking into and be specific about would be, you know, what does it mean to say biodegradation? Uh, what are the cost impacts of something that's new, right, within packaging? Or do you have uh, partnerships set up in place so um, you can help customers or consumers direct their packaging to the right recycling areas, right? Or they know how to handle it. Um, and I see someone talking about uh, complying with food safety. Absolutely, right? Medical grade, food grade is very, it, it's very to entry, right? So whatever the packaging is, uh, for a very obvious reason, it has to be able to comply to that. So in the polyester space, recycled polyester from bottle grades, um, in some cases, right, depending on the percentage and the process, that can't go back into food grade. But it's getting better. And at scale, there's an alternative for um, pyrolysis, right, which is just the melting of plastic bottles back into the materials that it will make, the new materials it will make. There's chemical recycling, right, which actually you can look at this in, in different materials. It's not just for polyester, but from a synthetics perspective, how do you break down the, the chemistry of the polyester chain back down into it, its component parts? So like if you're baking a cake, you're to put a cake in a box and then you're to depolymerize it or break it down into a com its component's part, its component parts, lift the box up and you have your eggs, your flour, your water, your milk. That's what's possible, right? With certain synthetic chemistries. And so when you're able to do that, you can rebuild that into something that does meet um, food safety or medical grade because it's, it's as if it's new. And I'm, I'm reading some of these messages or some of these comments right now. So in my experience, what is the best way to start changing the approach to sustainability in a company? So the triangle that I put up, right? Sustainability, performance, and economics. Now, if you have, depending on your role, right? If you have the runway, to be able to begin evaluating or running a landscape, right? You can, you can provide, or you can, you can um, uh, there are services out there that will create landscapes of all the opportunities out there with what if you're trying to do from a, a materials or a sustainability perspective that will show you, okay, I'm trying to replace this kind of a material. Here's all the opportunity, here's all the materials that could replace that. Here's the, Here's where they exist on a sustainability perspective. They're lower impact or they might be lower impact. 
Um, here's what they're reducing their impact in. And then the, from a performance perspective, uh, where the performance metrics are. And then most important, right, within a business, what are the economics? How is it affecting margin? Um, is it reducing steps? Is it cleaning up a system? What is it doing, right? Business is business. And within a company, you know, you have to be able to show that whatever the new sustainability push is, whatever you're trying to push within this company, how does it make, how does it simplify the practices that exist today? Or how does it make more money for the business? Because at the end of the day, right, you have to cover overhead. You have to feed the market. Right? So you can make a, a um, an argument there that will actually open you up to a new market market if the business is ready to go there. Um, so you have to be able to answer those three questions, sustainability, economics, and performance. Okay, so here is the, the last question I see. Um, in, in my opinion, how can I, or how can you overcome the cost challenge in sustainable packaging to make it more attractive for clients? So one of the, the lowest hanging fruit is, is, is there a way of just using less material? Um, for these brands that have been around for 50 plus years, products were created without thinking about how much material was being used, but to be able to focus on, you know, how the material was, or how the product was designed. So from a upstream supply chain perspective, how do you reduce your material usage? There are filler products, right? You can buy really low cost filler products. And instead of having, we'll say, we'll just, I'll just use polyester. Uh, well, polyester is a bad example. We'll say EVA, um, so foam under shoes, right? You can have 100% um we'll just say it's 100 percent eva there's all these other additives in there but let's just say it's 100 percent eva and that's what you sell today but you're trying to reduce uh you're trying to have something be more sustainable more attractive to the clients and you can fill maybe five percent of that with a filler material that not only reduces the more expensive material but but will reduce the cost as well so fillers are a phenomenal opportunity for reducing costs and reducing at the same time so i would, I would just look at that but you have to measure it against performance like there's there's a a balance right you can re, you can fill something with an alternative material that costs less and reduces the impact most of the time it's a natural product right so it has a really low impact, uh, natural generally. Um, and if you have five percent performance, might stay the same. Ten percent performance might stay the same, but then twelve percent it gets worse. So you know your your limits there. I see that um, Eric, did you have a question? Or if anybody had a question, uh, I heard someone talking. Excelente. Bueno, pues um, a todos, muchísimas gracias um, por sus preguntas, por las atenciones. Chase, um, nuevamente muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy. Con esto, pues estamos por concluida la, la primera semana de, de todas las actividades del Foro de Innovación. Recuerden que la próxima semana, martes, miércoles y jueves, tenemos actividades y conferencias para las diferentes industrias. Así que una cordial invitación para que nos acompañen. Muchas gracias, directores. Que tengan buen día. Chase, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Bye.